Good evening, everyone. God bless your hearts. Good evening, everyone. God bless your hearts. Uh, it's Thursday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, before, gee, what is today? The 18th? Is that right? The 18th day of... March 2021, the year's going by quickly. Now let me get a little bit of my coffee while I'm waiting on everyone to get on. We're just uh, just now getting on, giving people time. It's a cool day in, in um, central Arkansas, here in Little Rock. It's... Um, I believe it's 48 degrees. You know, one day it's 70, 75, almost 80. And next day it's 50. <laughs> Time of year. Spring's trying to break its way through. Anyway, uh, I appreciate, you know, the opportunity to, uh, to talk to God's people and share my heart again tonight. Um, we had a uh, Zoom meeting for the ministry in the body of Christ uh, this past Saturday. And uh, most of the meeting was taken up of uh, what had to do with the coronavirus vaccines. There's a lot of people had questions about the vaccine. And... Uh, since Sister Sherry and Sister Tara, Durham, Der, Terry's the only ones on here, I'm going to sip my coffee. I'll try to get it put down before we get started. Anyway, um, a lot of people had questions concerning the, the vaccines, you know, whether they should take it or whether they shouldn't take it or whether uh, it was safe to take or not. Um, you know, I'm going to, I don't feel like that it is um, a minister's prerogative to, to tell people to or to not take the vaccine. However, I am going to encourage people to take it, not, not demand it nor dictate that. But I'm a true believer that the only way we're going to get rid of this pandemic anytime soon will be if people take the vaccine. Um, I'll give you some thoughts about that. People who that are afraid of taking it, I'll just share some thoughts that I have on it. And that is... Uh, There's been 134 million vaccines given, with very little, um, very little side effects or repercussions. And there have been, I, I don't know, uh, I know, well, I know a lot of people that's taken the vaccine. I don't know anyone that's taken it that's had any serious side effects. I know a lot of people that's had coronavirus, and I know several that have died from it people that were close to me, close to my heart. Uh, <clears throat> I have people saying, you know, uh, that people are having reactions to severe reactions to the vaccine and, and that the people in the hospitals are hiding it from the public. That's impossible. If your mother or father or your child or your brother or sister got a vaccine and had serious side effects or died from it, do you, you would not tell nobody? I mean, the hospital might hide it, but are you going to hide it? I don't think so. There, the other thing is, is people say, well, it took a long time to develop the vaccine for the flu, but it only took six, six eight months to develop the vaccine for um, <clears throat> coronavirus. Number one, the, the flu vaccine, if you go back to 1918 and 1918, when they, what they call the Spanish flu 
which today they're pretty well proven it didn't come from Spain, but anyway, it was called the Spanish flu. <clears throat> there was absolutely no medical um, technology to even come up with a vaccine in, at that time uh, for the flu virus. And the reason it spread so violently, there's over 550 million people worldwide died with the Spanish flu. And 625,000 people of that was Americans, more than that have died already with coronavirus. It was basically spread from the from World War I. All the soldiers from all over the world, from Germany and France and Europe and, and America, uh, they had that epidemic all through those soldiers in the war and they all spread it throughout the world. Um, and it wasn't until 1945 that America was able to develop a vaccine for influenza. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there was a scientist, a medical doctor scientist, that uh, there was a place in, in Africa, I'm, I'm sorry, in Alaska, that was frozen off time, a place where they had buried several bodies of people that died with the flu uh, pandemic. He went back there in 1951 trying to uncover some of those graves and get some lung samples, hoping that he could, that it would, the, the Spanish flu of 1918 would be um, preserved, frozen in that soil and bring it back to America. Well, he flew back on a prop, <laughs> plane, a big plane, but it was a prop plane, and, and uh, it stopped several times for fuel. <clears throat> he used uh, fire extinguishers of that day to try to keep these samples from falling out on his way back, but by the time he got back, there was no live samples of the flu. It wasn't until 1994 that he actually was able to go back and get more samples and get get it back over here, and he was able to preserve the the, the 1918 flu. Uh, those flu samples from uh, samples of lungs of those cadavers, and uh, that helped considerably with their research. They found out that that flu was came from swine, not from birds as it was thought. But anyway, they were able to go back and, and look at the different strains that had developed over years. And, and it helped medical science quite a bit. He was 72 years old when he went back in 1994 to do that. Anyway, there have been several studies that's been developed from that finding. But <clears throat> to make a long story short, uh, today they can with the new strains of flu, of flu, flu epidemic that uh, developed today, they can make a vi they can make a vaccine in in twenty week twenty to twenty three weeks. So you can't compare how long it took to make a vaccine in nineteen forty five, uh, you know, or even after that, to how long it took them to do make a coronavirus vaccine today out of a, out of a brand new pandemic. But just shows you how inept our medical technology and scientific technology of medicine has, has developed over the years. So, uh, uh, I, you know, uh, again, there's been a 134 million vaccines given to date since the first vaccines came out with the Pfizer vaccines. And there's been very little uh, side effects that were serious. Um, I have taken my first vaccine shot. I have had I had three anaphylactic episodes, which is severe, severe uh, uh, 
allergic reactions. In fact, the third anti-phylactic reaction kills a lot of people. And I've had that allergy like that for <clears throat> 25, at least uh, maybe 20 years. Uh, it happened right after Brother Leninger passed away. So about 17 years, the first time I got it. So, um, but anyway, I, uh, I did a little bit of research and study and I felt like at my age to get coronavirus, uh, you know, I, I meet people, I know people my age that got it. Brother Johnny Budd, one of the, the greatest friends of my lifetime, closer to me than a brother, as healthy as could be, rode his bicycle 20, 25 miles a day, five days a week. Got the virus. If I ever thought anyone to live over it, it'd be Reverend Johnny Bud. He got it, went in the hospital. Two weeks he went in intensive care, and less than a week he was gone. Unbelievable. Just unbelievable. The way that this pandemic has, has affected people is unbelievable. I've got another friend in the body of Christ, Pastor, that's got it right now. He's 70. He's my age. Um, and, um, he, um, he's been in the hospital three weeks. He's not doing well. He's not doing good. He's holding his own, but he's close to having to go on a ventilator. And we're praying, praying, praying for him. But it's just, it. I was going to say, at my age, I'd rather take a chance on a very low-risk possible reaction to the vaccine than I had to take it. Because if you take one of the vaccines, you've got, 100% efficacy, they say, and I'll trust what they say. Somewhere, saints, you got to trust, and I'll trust medical science, scientific technology and evidence against people that don't know what they're talking about, that are afraid, just simply afraid. And I know that there's a lot of underhanded things goes on in this world, but uh, there's people dying, saints. There's over 500 what, 535,000 people and still a 1,000 dying every day in America, I'm talking about, with this pandemic. I'll trust the vaccine. I'll trust the medical professionals. I, I say that if, if there was anything underhanded going on, there's too many people, too many medical professionals, too many scientists, too many people of the know-how and know of the knowledge of what's going on that this would have leaked way before now. So I heard somebody say on the, on the TV today said, people say, I'm gonna wait on the, I'm gonna wait, watch. He, this was a medical professional. He said that we've given 134 million vaccines. How long are you gonna wait? What are you waiting for? <laughs> well, uh, my, my advice and counsel would be take the vaccine. My direction is you're going to have to make a personal and a private determination of what you're going to take. But uh, to me, it, to me, it's, it's not a hard decision to make. The, the, the cards are stacked way against coronavirus. And people that don't take it are going to continue to get coronavirus, and the coronavirus is going to continue to mutate and develop new strains, and it could get worse. Uh, some countries are already projecting that there's going to be new strains. It's going to develop a new surge in the fall of this year. They feel like if most people in the United States uh, will take the vaccine, that we won't have a surge. And as you can see, even though a thousand people a day are dying right now, it is dropping. It's continually dropping and we pray and hope that that continues. Anyway, I won't say any more about the, about that or the virus or the vaccine, but uh, for my part, I'm just giving you people keep asking and, and uh, I would be, uh, well, let's just, I'll just say this, that, that uh, for me to give my true opinion of it is that I took it, that ought to say something. I took it, I'm gonna take my second shot tomorrow. So we'll, we'll see how that goes, but I'm, I feel good about it. 
uh, I want to talk to you tonight, maybe a little bit about a question that I had uh, from the Dominicans and from our Zoom meeting that we have. Uh, uh, and that is, the question was, is what is the sin unto death? And is it, uh, are we subject to the sin unto death today? So let's look at that scripture in 1 John 5. If you go with me to 1 John, the fifth chapter. And I will say this, that, uh, you know, the reason I started off talking about the pandemic, the vaccine, vaccine and everything is to give people time to get on here so we can start our Bible study. There's still, uh, I don't know. Wait, let me look and see here. See, they say that some people can look on here and see how many people are actually logged in. Forgive me for getting a sip of coffee, but it's going to get cold on me if I don't do something and drinking it. But right now, I'm not showing, you know, and, and I know um, let me just see what this does. Nothing. Anyway, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to determine how many people are signed on uh, you know because one of the things that I'm wanting I'm trying to determine is what kind of following we're getting uh, on Thursday nights at seven o'clock Bible study because we canceled our Wednesday night I, I know that there's several churches that did not and um, sister Janique put on her 15 are watching currently, but I don't think it shows if they don't comment, if they don't put down they're watching, I don't think it shows that. Um, what, what did you just put? Oh, here. Hold on, sister. Okay, see, I'm showing now there's 67 people uh, that are showing on right now. I'm seeing now, okay. See, that's on Sister Janique, on on uh, on Brother Wayne McGowan's. There's 54 people. Brother Maine's 27 people. Sister Sandra, there's 98 mutual friends, including. See, they're watching from somebody else's. They're click. They're they're in with them, so it's hard to tell how many people are actually on here sometimes. Anyway. Um, but anyway, some of them, I don't know. I don't know who all's watching every time. And McGowan got 67 friends watching with her or just on her site, 58 on Sister Jerry Fritz's site. So I don't know. I, uh, and I may be reading that wrong because it's I'm clicking on everyone's name and it shows there. So anyway, we'll, maybe we'll find out some point later, but I still have never been able to figure it out exactly. I'm showing that there's, uh, well, I'm not showing. So anyway, I, I let's go back to John, the fifth chapter. I was stating the question that I got uh, on the Zoom meeting that we have on on Monday nights. We have a Zoom meeting on Monday nights with the Spanish-speaking folks in the Dominican Republic and some in Mexico and uh, and others that uh, we have a, a Bible study there. We, did, we started that for the <clears throat> Dominican pastors and ministers <clears throat> or in fact anybody that wants to watch over there but it's grown to other people. We have a sister in Chile now on with us. We've got brother Fidel from Guatemala, city Guatemala. We've got people from many other countries that are on that Zoom meeting. Anyway, uh, here in the 16th chapter of 1 John, 
Um, excuse me just a second. I'm in, I'm in, uh, I was in St. John 5, 15, 16. Yes. It says here, <clears throat> John says, if any man see a brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. <clears throat> we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. So, well, first, I, I would say we probably ought to look at the scripture in, in uh, Romans 5. Romans 5 and 17. Uh, if you wonder how, what I'm doing, I have half of my computer screen uh, with me on it uh, live that I'm, I can see myself talking. The other half has got my Bible. I've, en I've encouraged the people here um, uh, so um, I've encouraged the people here locally to get the Bible Olive Tree Bible app I highly recommend that app it's, I've used it for years it's in my opinion, it's the best Bible app out there that I've been able to find or use. It's user-friendly and has a lot of uh, availability for free. Only thing I do recommend is that you do get King James Version Strong's Concordance uh, Bible on there. And that does cost $19.95, but you can get everything else basically free. But you can highlight scriptures, you can underline scriptures, you can make notes to any word or any scripture. It's just very, very uh, resourceful. And uh, I've told the people here, the ones that want to get it, they, that way I can actually send them my notes that I make on scriptures. And, and that way they'll have the truth. <laughs> I'm just joking. <clears throat> I know that there's different uh, positions on different scriptures, but <clears throat> of course, <clears throat> I wouldn't have a note on something that I didn't think was the truth, but I will admit that we may have to make adjustments on some things that we're looking at. <clears throat> I'll read to you here what Sister Janique said. Said it, it could be that 20 are on your direct feed, but then others also shared the view, their view, and people are watching on their links too, which is very good. Yeah. Um, so I've got 22 right now on my feed. Uh, but like I said, there's several people that's got a lot of people on theirs. And I can't see just, I don't think I can see everybody. My wife, I just clicked on her and it shows 254 mutual friends, including Sandra York and Michael Smith. So I don't know. I, have, I don't know what's going on with all that stuff. But anyway, there's people watching it, looks like. Okay, let's go back to the scriptures. I don't want to get you confused here. In Romans 5, 17, it says, far is that the scripture I want. Maybe, let's see. Maybe I want to start the 16th. No, for by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more of they that receive abundance of grace and gift of righteousness shall reign by one, Jesus Christ. Um, the scripture I wanted, which I was thinking was here. Yes, verse 12, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. <clears throat> so I just thought we ought to state concerning this scripture in 1 John 5, that there is a sin unto death. 
that needs some explanation because all sin is unto death. Sin, because of sin, death passed on to everyone. Everyone is subject to death and to die because of sin. But you have to go a little bit deeper to understand what John is talking about you got to understand he's talking to people that understands the, their, that terminology. So go with me to uh, Matthew, the 12th chapter. Let's look at what Jesus said here in Matthew 12 and somewhere around 30. Okay, <clears throat> maybe we should back up a little bit here to get the context of what, why he said what he said. Um, verse 22 says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. This is amazing. This man was could not speak like, like a deaf and dumb mute. He didn't say he was deaf, but he was dumb. He could not speak, and he was blind. And they brought him to Jesus, and uh, he healed him. But when the Pharisees, verse 24, when the Pharisees heard him, uh, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of, of the devils. Beelzebub was the name that uh, <clears throat> that they used back then, uh, that was one of the names that they used for Satan. Or, uh, you know, there were several ways that they looked at how evil, the source of evil, evil was back in those days. It came through uh, the dragon of the beast, the head of the beast of, of Greece, which was very mystical, uh, had very many mystical beliefs. Anyway, so they accused him of casting out devils by another power, an evil power, rather than the power of God. And <clears throat> verse 25 says, Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But I cast out devils by the Spirit of God. Then the, If I cast them out by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house is spoil as good except the first. Find the strong man and then he'll spoil his house. He that is not with me is against me and he that gathereth not with me shall scattereth abroad. In other words, he's saying, you know, you're accusing me of casting out. If I'm of the devil and I'm casting out my own evil uh, subjects, that, how foolish would that be? But how can you do this uh, if you don't go in another man's house and bind the strong before you're able to do that? Now, here's a scripture I wanted to get to. Uh, verse 31, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And, verse 32, Whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Well, see, uh, uh, what he's saying here is they, they are, uh, they're coming against Christ and not accepting him nor his person. But what he's saying is, look, you'll be forgiven for blasphemy, denying or coming against. He that speaketh against the, uh, how did he say that? 
Whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. Whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither the world to come. <clears throat> what he was saying was, you're seeing an absolute operation of the Spirit of God. And you deny that, you're not going to get any. If you deny the Spirit of God in operation, you're not going to be forgiven for that. Now, you can speak against me, my character, my person. You cannot believe in me, but the absolute manifestation of God's spirit, you make a stand against that, there, you're, there is no forgiveness for that. Number one, now, I want to carry this a little bit further uh, because what he was saying, there's blasphemy. I'll, I'll name some. The apostle Paul blasphemed against Christ. He was against him. He preached against Christ being the Messiah. He he put people in jail. Uh, people were murdered because of uh, and uh, martyred because of their belief in Jesus. And Paul was a part of that. You remember he was just a young man when Stephen was stoned, and he was in agreement with it. Uh, until God not, uh, blinded him and knocked him down on the road to Damascus, the apostle Paul blasphemed and spoke against Christ. That was forgiven, not only forgiven him, but he was chosen man of God. Even while he was doing those things, he was chosen. God knew what he was going to do with him. But if you if you spoke against the Holy Ghost, and let's let's go to Matthew uh, Mark, the third chapter in the twenty eighth verse. And look at Mark's uh, statement on this. He's talking about the same thing, uh, recapturing what he saw himself. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blaspheming wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost shall never, hath never forgiveness but is in danger of eternal damnation. So there he saw eternal judgment. Uh, a person was in danger of. Um, and we'll have to carry this further to get the understanding why Jesus said not in this world, nor in the world to come. See, that was a divine order. The church back there had a divine order of God and a, a absolute full manifestation was God, of God was in that manifestation after the day of Pentecost. Remember, Jesus told his disciples, these things have I done, but greater shall you do because I go to the Father. He knew that they was going to carry on the work, but they were going to receive the Holy Ghost. No man had ever received the baptism of the Holy Ghost or been born again uh, until after Jesus came to this world. Uh, that's why Jesus told Nicodemus in St. John 3, uh, uh, <clears throat> you must be born again. Showed you can that's that's born of the flesh is born of the flesh, but that that's born of the spirit is born of the spirit. So uh, it required a born again experience, and that is in receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. That here's what Jesus said concerning that gift in Saint John fourteen. Um, he said, uh, I'll just go to it and read it for you. In John 14, I got to hurry up. I want to get, I want to say more about this. And, um, Let me get you the exact scripture. Verse 
Verse 19 said, yet a little while the world seeth me no more, but you see me. Because I live, you shall live also. Uh, <clears throat> and that day you'll know that I am in my Father, and he in me, and I in you. See, um, uh, in, uh, but if we back up the 17th verse, it says, even the spirit of truth whom the world, uh, he, he was, he, he's saying, uh, let me go ahead and back up the 16th verse. And I'll pray the father and he'll give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth it not, neither know him, but you shall know him for he dwelleth with you. Get that right there. For he dwelleth with you. See, the Holy Ghost dwelled with uh, those dis those disciples at the at that time, but he said, "But he shall be in you." Um, well, I'm underlining that in my Bible right quick. Just give me a second. All right. Then he said, I won't leave you comfortless. I'll come unto you a little while the world see if me no more. But you shall see me. Now get this, because I live. See, they did not have life, not, a, not God life. They didn't have God's nature. They weren't born of God. They were born of Adam and death overshadowed every one of them. There, there was absolutely no way they could ha have life in their soul uh, be alive unto God, but because he was alive unto God, they would either, they would too, when they get this comforter, he's been with them. See, the Holy Ghost was with John the Baptist, but he was never born of the Holy Ghost. Not, well, not, not, not even until he died. He had to get a resurrection to get the Holy Ghost. And verse 20 said, in that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Then if you go on down uh, in verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, if any man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. In other words, through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. How do you know that, Brother Smith? Look in verse 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. See, he said up above, he was gonna send the comforter. He said here, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you, bring all things to remembrance, whatever I said unto you. And so uh, God showed them that when he sent the Holy Ghost back, that when they received that comforter, the Holy Ghost, and they received it. Remember, it was so important that Jesus, when he resurrected from the grave, that he went back first to the house where his disciples were. He didn't go to heaven. He had more work to do. He went back to the house and he talked to them and he blew on them. He breathed on every one of them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Then they saw him for like 40 days, 50, uh, you know, it was 50 days later when the day of Pentecost came and he, he sent them into the, uh, uh, where was it they, uh, that they went into their upper room the, uh, on the day of Pentecost and stayed together there waiting for the promise of the father. This is the promise he was talking about. And so uh, Jesus, it was so important for him to make sure that they understood that they, before they'd done anything else after his death, burial, and resurrection was to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which they received on the day of Pentecost. And so uh, he sent the Holy Ghost back on that day. They received the Holy Ghost and they were born again, and they became alive unto God. And so they had life. Now, from that time moving forward, 
that was the harvest of the end of the Jewish world that God manifested himself through those 12 apostles and the apostle Paul to the Gentiles in a complete manifestation with a sevenfold life, a complete uh, understanding uh, of the word of God and God's purpose in the end of that world to make up a portion of his bride that would rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Now, what Jesus is saying here, uh, and John makes this statement about a sin unto death, those people who rejected this manifestation of God during that 40-year period, or 40, I would say it's 45-year period, that generation from A.D. Uh, I mean, from uh, Pentecost until AD 70, and I even carry it seven and a half years beyond that. But that, because the day of the Lord is called a, a month and a day, 30 year and a 15 year period, 45 prophetical years. And so uh, during that period of time, if you saw and God manifested himself and you you were living during that time and God dealt with you and you rejected that, there was no forgiveness for rejecting that. God can't forgive you for rejecting him. And But I don't think anyone has committed that kind of sin unto this day during the Gentile world after the falling away of the church because we'll have to have a restored church and a sevenfold light and a full manifestation of God for you to, you, you haven't ever seen a full manifestation of God yet. I do think we're getting close to a restored church and God's full manifestation and a harvest in the end of the Gentile world. But and right now people even deny it. See, the, the Jews, they were, it was, uh, there wasn't no forgiveness in that world are the world to come. That's us down here. And anyone that rejects this restored church full manifestation of God that harvests the end of the Gentile world. Uh, you say, well, both Smith, they're not going to get a resurrection. No, they're not. And here's why. Uh, people that lived when there was not a full manifestation will get a resurrection for the opportunity to see a full manifestation of God so that they can be judged uh, properly. God's not going to judge people that haven't had a proper opportunity to receive his fullness. But once you've received his fullness, what would giving you a resurrection do? He's already showed you everything he could possibly show you in a resurrection and you reject it. And therefore, there is no forgiveness in that world for rejecting that full manifestation of God, and there won't be down here in this world either. Now, he didn't say, uh, you know, he didn't say in the during the thousand years, but uh, the Jews will be grafted back in in the end of the Gentile world. Paul said in Romans 11, he said, uh, uh, called them a tame olive branch. It showed how they were cut off and that us Gentiles as a wild olive branch was grafted in to the kingdom of God back there in the end of the Jewish world. How much more, them being a tame olive branch, how much more is it possible for God to graft them back in? But he said that that wouldn't happen until the end of the Gentiles become. So uh, in the end of this world, God will graft the Jews back in. Uh, the prophet said, uh, when they look on him whose side they pierced, and uh, after two days, that's talking about 2,000 year prophetical days that it would take. God's holding them right now in the parable of the, a rich man in Lazarus. See, Lazarus is a Gentile. He went into Abraham's bosom in that parable, but the rich man went into hell. That's a, that is a, uh, 
a religious hell, a tataru. That that's a hellish condition that that uh, the Jew went into. I'm sorry, uh, you know, I don't mean to throw off on the Jewish people because I do believe they were God's chosen elect, and and God is holding them right now. There's a great gulf fixed. See, Jesus showed in that parable that that, that Lazarus couldn't even wet their tongue. There was too great of a gulf. We, there's a gulf fixed between us and, and the Jew that we can't reach them and they haven't been able to reach us. But in the end of this world, when God begins to touch them and touch their minds, don't think he can't. He can. He will raise up men. That's a picture of Elijah his mantle touching Elisha, plying with 12 yoke of oxen. When he dropped his yoke of oxen, took out running after Elijah and said, I've got to follow you. And he said, what did I do to you? He said, I have to follow you. Let me go tell my mom and daddy goodbye. That's what Paul did when God touched him on the road to Damascus. He said, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees of the tribe of Benjamin, but I count all that loss that I might win him, speaking of Christ, uh, when his eyes got open, he he forgot about, he saw that he was the Messiah and that he was uh, uh, to accept that and follow the calling of the Lord. And there'll be those down here that God will deal with among the Jews and God will graft them back in. God's hold those, held those people I'll tell you why. One of the reasons God's held those people where they're at, there's not another people after God makes up his bride and judges this Gentile world. See, everyone that's in this world that doesn't accept this harvest that God's going to bring about in the end of this world and make up the remainder of his bride, those people are going to reject just like those people back there rejected the move of God and they'll never be forgiven for that, that they're in danger of eternal damnation. Those, when the judgment seat of Christ is set up, eternal damnation will take place. And so uh, let's look, let's look at Hebrews. And I know that I'm talking about a pretty deep subject here tonight, but I think you need to understand this subject. You need to realize what you're, what what we're uh, looking into here, as far as sin unto death. See, uh, what John was saying was there is a sin unto death. I don't say that you pray for that. See, you can pray for people. In fact, you remember what Jesus told the disciples. He said, "Whosoever sins you." you retain or be retained, whosoever sins you remit or be remitted. But they had they knew not to re, try to ask for forgiveness for someone that was rejecting the body of Jesus Christ. They rejected the body of Jesus Christ and the head of that body back there, the, the moving of the Holy Ghost, the manifestation of the Spirit of God the Father that was through Christ and his ministry in the end of that world. And they rejected that. There was no forgiveness for them. That was an eternal judgment that was upon them. And, uh, and if you, if one rejects that down here, there'll be an eternal judgment upon them. Uh, let's look at the scripture here and, and we'll start out in Hebrews 6. Uh, where he says, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptism, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgments. Those are four major doctrines of the Bible. And he said, this will we do if God permit. What will we do if God permit? Go on to perfection and go beyond uh uh, the the uh, foundation of repentance and dead works and faith towards God and of these four major doctrines and understanding them. 
Then he says in verse four, for it is impossible. Now, let's read that. For it's impossible for those who were once enlightened, enlightened, have tasted the heavenly gift, been made partakers of the Holy Ghost, tasted the good word of God and the, of the power of the world to come, if they fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now let's read that like this. Let's leave out all of his uh, adjectives of what's impossible. For it is impossible, verse six, if they fall away, it's impossible if they fall away to renew them again under repentance, sounds like eternal judgment, sin unto death, doesn't it? Seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Now let's go back up to verse four. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. Have you been enlightened? Yes, you have to an extent, but you don't have a sevenfold light yet. We we haven't we don't have a restored church where we have a sevenfold light. If we had a sevenfold light, we wouldn't have ministers with a difference in doctrine. See, in that day, Isaiah said, they will, the watchman will see eye to eye. See, those men back there were in the, the unity of the faith. They understood the truth of the word of God, and they did not hold different positions on different doctrines like we see are being done today. And we might as well admit the truth that we are not in unity on doctrine yet or in understanding. And please don't water down the word of God and try to say that, you know, we're never going to have that. I'm sorry. We are going to have that. The Bible declares it. Uh, they had it in the early church. If we have a restored church, we'll have it. I, I'm not going to water this down. Neither am I going to accept anything less than what the word of God says. And uh, so we've been enlightened, yes, to an extent. We've got, we definitely have knowledge, greater knowledge and greater understanding than I believe has ever been, ever been in the Gentile world since the falling away of the church in this restoration period. God has brought us a long ways but we still have a ways to go and have tasted of the heavenly gift. That's the, the gift is Christ. Remember Jesus told the little Samaritan woman at the well, he said, if you knew the gift of God, you'd ask to get a drink from him. See, but she didn't realize the gift of God that was in Christ that was standing before her. And we're still learning a lot about our Savior. Uh, do you know him? Yes, you do know him, at least in part. But we're still getting to know our Savior. We're still getting to know his character. We're still getting to know, know the truth. He was the manifest word of God. And we're made partakers of the Holy Ghost. You know, sometimes I think we're not near as aware of what we have received in this comforter, the life of the nature of God that's been imparted to us. But I sometimes, I know we don't take care of it properly, nor are we standing at all of what's actually took place and happened to us. But when God restores the church and God's full manifestation comes, I think we will fear God. And that word fear means to stand in awe of and be uh, beholders of his glory in, in a, a much fuller state. And then tasted of the good word of God. I've already mentioned that. What we've been enlightened of, what we've tasted. I don't want to just taste it. I want to digest it. I want it to become a part of me. And then the powers of the world to come. I don't think we've, I don't even think we've tasted that yet. I don't think that we've had men overcome to the state of ruling and reigning that they've 
100% have overcome the Adamic nature and moved into the holy place. I don't think you'll have overcome the Adamic nature when you move into the holy place, but I do believe you'll have to live above sin to get in there, and then you'll finish your course in that place like Jesus Christ did. So, all right, we have this scripture. Now let's go, let's finish up here in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. I want to deal with this chapter here. Um, we'll start in the 26th verse. Here he says, if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice of sins. See, we're still trying to obtain the full knowledge of the truth. But if we sin willfully after that, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despiseth Moses' law without mercy under two or three witnesses. Let's read that again. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now look, look at this next verse. Of how much sore, that word sore means worse, much more intense punishment than dying without mercy like those did under Moses' law. How much more sub punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite the spirit of grace. For we know that he, that we know him that hath said, vengeance is mine, uh, vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. So, uh, I'm just giving you these two scriptures to go along with this sin unto death. Then there's a sin not unto death. Uh, John said in 1 John 5, we'll say just in closing something quickly about that. There, you, Did you know there was a the sin offering under Moses' law in the tabernacle and the temple? was a That was an offering for um, unintentional sin. Uh, even an offering was offered up, sin offering for the whole people uh, by the high priest uh, that, that was for unintentional sin for the congregation. But a sin offering was to be offered for that. But right now, God's counted you and I worthy because of faith. We're justified by faith and he's counted us worthy. He's not imputed sin, but we, he's imputed righteousness to us because of the work on the cross. Therefore, if you're doing all you know to do and you're doing all God's asking of you to do and you're diligent to serve God in that, then God counts you just, upright, righteous, worthy, blessed, uh, a saint, holy. God's counting you righteous right now because of the work on Christ. If you any man sins, he has a, uh, a mediator with the Father. He is our propitiation for our sins. So uh, God will forgive you. Uh, it's not unto eternal death. You haven't got to the place yet that God it will eternally judge you for rejecting the full manifestation of God. And that judgment only takes place in the end of the Jewish world, the end of this world, and down through the thousand years, including the eighth day white throne judgment. That eternal judgment seat or the judgment seat of Christ is set up at that time. All right, God bless your hearts. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to please pray for uh, Brother Rick Jolly. I haven't got a report on him today. Brother, he's a pastor of, of the church in Jasper, Texas. He's my age. 
He's got coronavirus. He's been in the hospital, I think, around three weeks. And he's just been barely able to stay off the ventilator. Uh, he was holding his own yesterday, but the day before they had said that he had took a turn a little bit for the worse. They're trying to wean him off of some of the medication and some of the oxygen. And, and of course, his body is trying to come up with that weaning process. And that's what's making him look like he's turning worse. According to his son, uh, I got a report secondhand from his son, but but from his son's pastor. And so pray for Brother Rick and Jolly, if you would, please. Also for Brother Phil Fisher, Sister Chelsea Fisher, their little uh, baby, Mallory is her name. I keep having trouble coming up with her name exactly right, but I believe I got it now, Mallory. And um, she, she's she been in the hospital for, I don't know, maybe a month. Uh, she's got a heart condition. Uh, she's got several conditions at, uh, of her birth. They need a miracle from God to touch that little child and get it well enough so they can bring it home. And, and uh, so if you would pray for, this family, brother and sister Fisher, their their family, their children, it's affecting their children. And then this little baby, our church is holding up in prayer and asking God to give us, uh, give us uh, uh, give us a miracle. Yes. Uh, Brother Faustin put up that scripture in Hebrews 10, 26. I covered that. Thank you, Brother Faustin. It's good to see you. Anyway, God bless your hearts. Uh, pray for the church in Little Rock, the work in the Dominican Republic. Pray for Brother John Bud's works, Nacogdoches, Sebastopol, uh, Brownsville, the works over in Mexico. Brother, uh, Brother Memo Cano, Brother... Uh, Hugo Rodriguez are the two main men that's worked in those works over in Mexico. Pray for those brothers, uh, all of those men and the works that Brother Bud had. Brother Bud, I know Brother Bud. I talked to him almost every day when he was in the hospital before he got so bad he couldn't talk after he went in, well, after he went on uh, the ventilator for sure. But even before that, they had him on the BiPAP machine and, uh, he just got so sick and, and it, it happened so fast that I just don't believe Brother Bud was able to actually set everything in the order he wanted it in. And therefore, we need God's hand to help with those works. And uh, they're very capable men that God's got in those works and those works will be all right. But, but I certainly believe, especially those of us that knew him and knew those works very well, or to hold them up in prayer. So pray with us about that, if you would. I sure would appreciate it. And I know that the, those men uh, pastoring and taking care of those works would appreciate your prayers also. Uh, pray for the Dominican Republic. The work's over there. God's done a great work in the Dominican. Uh, I'm supposed to get my next vaccine tomorrow in a couple of weeks. I should be you know, getting to a place sometime later this year, I'm hoping to be able to make a trip to visit these places. Uh, praise God. All right, God bless your hearts. It, it, some of you didn't get on to after seven o'clock, so I'm not running late. I'm just giving you your full hour's worth. <laughs> God bless your hearts. I love all of you. Pray for me and I'll pray for you. Have a good night.